Gabriel Ott, co-founder, chief executive officer of Freeno. Welcome to Juicing with Gary. Thanks for having me. Are you kidding me? It's an honor to have you here today. I've never juiced before, so. You've never juiced? Yeah. Do you like juice? I love juice. I love smoothies. I've made smoothies before, but I've never oh, juiced. Oh, this is healthier so. than a smoothie. For yes. all of my guests, I make a special juice just for you. All right. Do you know what this one is called? No. Jamaican me crazy, man. Because I look so Jamaican. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's because I love coconuts, coconuts, and I love limes. What I'd like you to do is let's get the juice out of the coconut. What we can do. Just go crazy. Gabriel, you got it. You got a hole. Yeah. We have it in juice. So let's get the juice oh. in there. Yep, try not to pour it all over the toast. Okay, that's it. Oh, beautiful. Coconut juice is so good for you. That's why people drink it today. It's actually not bad. Well, it's good for your kidneys. We're gonna make a really heart healthy juice here today. We're gonna start by you cutting up a couple limes. The other thing, tomatoes. Right. Anything with a purple or a red color to it is excellent for your health. All right, Gabriel, now we're ready to make the juice. You ready? All right, all right this Let's is all it. up to you. Now, don't mess this up, all right? This is very important, all right. Right here. Start together. So we're gonna start with the tomato. Throw right. them in there. That's it. Go ahead, put them in there. That's it, and just crush them down. Look at it. Oh, yep. right. Okay, now we go with the cucumber. Oh, cucumbers are next because they add a little bit of the color, but they add the flavor. We're mixing flavors. Look at this, carrots. All right. All right, we're gonna break these. Let's get our carrots straight going in. in there. Just put them straight in. All right. We're gonna put in the coconut water, man. All right. And finally, I want you to take a thumb. Yep. Take it off there. Little ginger. Just good for the heart, good for the head, good for everything that ails you. Okay, get it in All right. there. Okay, shut off the juicer. Gabriel, I mean, like a professional. Well, first of all, thanks for being here today. Thank Seriously, you. we're excited to have you here. We're really excited to have a conversation about genomics. So with that said, let's go have some juice and a conversation. Cheers. Cheers. Well, Gabriel, thanks again for being here today. Thanks for juicing. Yeah, it was much more explosive than I thought it was going to be, but it was <laughs> well, fun. As we get into Freenome and some of the amazing things you're doing around the human gene, and so excited to learn about that. But first, I want to learn about you. Sure. So talk to me about Gabriel. You know, where'd you come from? Tell me your story. Yeah, uh, I was uh, born in Korea. Grew up there until I was 10, uh, and then moved to the United States with my brother. Uh, my biological father was uh, very abusive um, so my mother had to go ahead just for her sake and she brought us over after a few years when we came over um, finally and got reunited i think that's when my life really started we found computer programming as as an outlet for me to learn how to think logically how to uh, teach a computer how to do things for you uh, and then it just took on a life of its own you know this was before the app store this was before the iphone um, it was not cool to code when you were young. In fact, I was so terrified of telling my friends that I code, uh, coded. Um, and, and so like I had to like, I played multiple sports in high school, like just to be a jock and just to be cool um, so that I didn't have to like be labeled as the nerd or the geek, uh, right? Um, but I really loved it. That's where my passion was. I made my first public software when I was 12 uh, and released that. Uh, some people at Apple saw that app, were using that app, um, and so they called me up when I was 17 and offered me a, an internship. So Apple called you, you're 17 years old, and they offered you a job? Yeah. Started working uh, in, uh, on one of their teams, uh, learned a lot. I broke the code base the first week I was there because I, knew, I, I didn't know how to code in a group or anything like this, but I, I learned how to do that over time, and that was really an amazing experience. It formed a lot of you know, how I thought about tech, how I thought, ta thought about software development, how I should be th uh, thinking about project management, all of these things I learned organically through that job. Collaboration is such an important cornerstone to making anything great, right? Simple things people can do on their own, great things they can't. Um, and, and I think it was my first step in understanding that the power of collaboration, um, but also the pains of collaboration, um, and, and the need to empathize with one another. Talk about Penn, talk about your experience. So after graduating from undergrad, I uh, decided to continue my education. I also wanted to become a scientist. I wanted to change people's lives. I wanted to cure diseases. Up to that point, I had been successful in a lot of things uh, in my life, and a lot of people gave me credit for doing things younger than you know, what would have been expected of me. That does something funny to your brain because uh, you all of a sudden think that you can do anything you want, um, that you can treat people however you want it. And um, I 
I'm definitely not proud of some of the things that I did in grad school with respect to how I treated people. And I was really disappointed in, in what science was like, at least from my experience, because it, it became increasingly clearer as I was in that program that it was not about necessarily furthering science to make people's lives better, but it was much more short-sighted than that. It was, it was much more pragmatic than that, right? We have to publish this paper at all costs so that people can see that we're doing the work so that we can go after the next grant. I learned the importance of humility and self-awareness uh, through this experience. And it actually informs everything that I do as uh, CEO now, how I run the company, the culture that we built at uh, Freenome, the types of people that we hire is actually all informed by not only uh, my personal failures in grad school, but some of the uh, negative things that I saw at large in grad school, um, including the culture. So you uh, referred to yourself when we met earlier today as a PhD dropout, right? Yes. But you're not a dropout. You then created something. So what happened when you left Penn? I started a company. I started a tech company. Um, and it was a breath of fresh air because I was building stuff. I was going to help people with this uh, technology. Um, my grandfather, who raised me uh, till I was 10, got diagnosed with cancer. Everyone has family or friends that get Get, uh, gets cancer, but I think my frustration with it was how long it took for him to even get diagnosed. So from the time when they told him, you might have cancer, to you definitely have cancer and we need to do something about it, I think it was more than six months. I, I, I can't believe that, that that is how medicine works, right? Um, it really doesn't cater to the patient's well-being outside of just like, this is your physiology and we're going to make your physiology healthy. Um, and this happened several times with him because he has been diagnosed with cancer, I think, three separate times. Um, he is I am currently on, on his deathbed, actually. Um, and, 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 you know, he thought he was going to die a few years back. He pulled out of it and, and the cancer came back and the doctors didn't do anything in between, right? They, they just say, you're healthy now. So what does the cancer do? It comes back, and this time it's too late to do, to do anything about it. I believe that there is a missing piece in curing cancer, and that just finding it at the right time. A lot of people think that cure the cancer is in the next drug, the next best drug, the magic bullet that's gonna cure that disease. By the time you have stage four cancer, right, which is like 80% of the cancer that we detect today is in like stage three, stage four, the cancer is not just one disease anymore because it changes as it grows. It's like 100 different diseases at the same time. We're never going to have a magic bullet. And so the cure to cancer is really in the early detection. And making that early detection as easy as possible for people is, is the key and that is in the form of blood tests. And our first product that we're working on right now is actually a, a colorectal cancer blood test that hopefully will one day replace colonoscopies, that will uh, one day um, be able to be something that people can take with their regular physicals so that we can detect that uh, cancer and cure it when it's actually curable. So how does it work? I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here and my mind is blowing. You know, genomics in itself is you know, beyond my capability, sure. right? And, and here you are, a bunch of you, uh, at Freenome and, and working on this. How does it, you know, yeah. put it together for me? So there are these um, DNA and RNA fragments that are floating around in your blood, uh, bloodstream right now, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they come from cells that have died. What happens is when you develop a tumor, one of the first things that your body does is tries to attack it, tries to get rid of it, and the, your immune system is doing that. Those DNA and RNA fragments have a different signature than a healthy immune cell that is just floating around, not trying to attack a tumor. Once we find these signatures in the blood, we can tell which tissue it's in. Um, so whether it's a colorectal cancer versus a breast cancer. We can actually tell people whether they're going to respond to a particular therapy or not. Hopefully we can actually funnel them into the therapy that's actually gonna, going to work for them. Every single diagnostics test that's ever been created 
has gone down in performance after it launched because the clinical trial that was uh, used to assess the performance initially was too small. What if we could create a software-driven diagnostics test that can take the blood sample, compare it to all the knowledge that it's already learned, but then continue to refine itself so that it gets more and more accurate as it sees more data. Um, and, and we believe that this was the only way to get to a diagnostics test that will one day be 100% accurate. Um, because we can't fund a clinical trial that's large enough to have 100% accuracy. No one can. And so the only way to do it is by creating this software-driven diagnostics. And we're, I believe we're one of the first companies to do that. What's the process? Uh, FDA? Yeah. Um, we are currently actually in the clinical validation stage. Um, so we're uh, doing the prospective trials. We're collecting the samples. Um, and, and once that trial is completed, the test will be available for people. It would be through my doctor's office? Yes. Pretty much? Yeah. Just like, just like when you do any kind of blood panel, Hopefully this will be another test on that panel. And I can avoid the nasty colonoscopy that people my age get yes. on a regular basis. Yes. Or nice. even uh, there, you know, sometimes there's fecal tests that can also be done and people really don't like pooping in a bucket. You know, saving people from these kinds of uh, very unpleasant or invasive tests is, uh, is one thing. Of course, with some of the cancer types that we're going after, there are no tests at all. Um, and, and so we're, we're developing those as well. I mean, this is really fascinating. Let's yeah. talk about these great people. Talk about yeah. the great work. What, tell us about it. So the culture at Freenome was very much informed by my grad school experience. And it's really focused around this fundamental idea of uh, servant leadership. Um, and, and more than that, an empathetic leader. I've realized that the more self-aware your manager or your leader is, uh, the more that person can actually make the right decision that is a combination of people under you and people over you uh, and the advice that they give you. Um, I think when you're doing a startup, no one can tell you what the right answer is because no one's really done what you've done. And the best way to make the best decision possible is by actually understanding fully what you know and what you don't know and then relying on people around you for the things that you don't know. We actually decided to systematize this um, in, in our company where our compensation philosophy is actually tied directly to level of self-awareness. Most of the interpersonal fires that happen in companies is because somebody's not self-aware or somebody's being too arrogant. And, and so when you tie self-awareness to essentially the person's well-being within the company, a lot of these fires start going away. Once we started enacting this system where people can set their egos aside, we are all of a sudden doing projects across all of these uh, departments, and it's not, it, it no longer becomes about who you are and, and what department that you belong to. It only matters, I do whatever it takes to make this company successful, um, because that's what matters, not my ego. That's the best example of true collaboration. Yes. and cohesiveness that I could ever imagine. And you are creating a culture of health within your own group. Yes. Think about that. That's just, that's fascinating. So thank you for being here today. Thanks for juicing. And thanks for telling us this great story. Thank you. Cheers to you.